So welcome to everyone. Um, I'm going to kind of give you the rundown of how today will work. And then I'm going to continue with my, my thanks. And I'll introduce Dr. Stewart. And following that, we will have our keynote. So um, while we are while we are here today, we want to make sure that we are as focused as possible and, and present. And, and based on some feedback that we've gotten from our past pick and some conversation that we had, we've decided that during our keynote speaker's address, we will disable the chat feature. Now that will be re-enabled during our Q&A session. Um, and I also encourage you to use the raise hand function on Zoom, which should be under your reactions button if your, if your Zoom has been updated. Um, after our Q&A session, we will have final remarks from our president, Russ Cavaluna, and that will close out today's conference. Um, also, please be aware that you will receive an email from us, from our committee, um, asking for your feedback. It'll be a very short survey, very brief, but we would we do take all of your, your opinions, your perspectives on what we've done under advisement to try to make things better. So please complete that. And if you are interested in joining the PIC 2022 committee, please reach out to our co-chairs, Tessa Betts and Tazine Ayu. okay? So with that being said, um, please give me a moment to, to thank some of the people and some of the groups that have been responsible for today's session. Um, first, I'd like to thank um, our president, Russ Cavaluna, for helping us to being open to us having today's session and also for the financial contributions of the college to have this session and also to our local 1650 executive board led by President John McDonald for also helping to make this possible, especially as it comes to financially contributing. Um, I'd like to thank two of our vice presidents at the college, one, Mr. Reginald Vest, um, for, for his work, especially recently in, in addressing um, issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion at our college and trying to make, make our college a better place. And also Vice President Rhonda DeLong for her, her leadership in all the logistics today, all of the marketing, the communication, and just a lot of wisdom and kind of helping bring this together. So thank you, Rhonda. Um, I'd also like to thank the entire PIC 2020 committee. And I am going to please and I'm going to indulge and, and, and thank people individually. Elaine, Elaine Lewisell. Um, Great probing questions, great insights at every meeting, making us think about things we may not have thought of. And, and that's befitting of a psychology instructor. So thank you, Elaine, for, for all of your help and all of your insights. Um, Pam Stewart. Pam Stewart, one of the kindest, one of the sweetest, one of the most thoughtful people that I know at the college or outside of the college. And, and if Pam is on a committee, then the committee is gonna be better for it. So thank you, Pam, for, for everything that you've done. Um, Jeff Morford, can't say enough about Jeff, really appreciate him. He, um, Jeff has a great, a great um, acerbic wit and it's, it's only matched by his intelligence. Um, I have leaned on Jeff and asked for his wisdom and his thoughts on a lot of things and I appreciate his leadership. Jeff was on this committee long enough to be a CTEI director, lose, be, stop being a CTEI director and now be back as a CTEI director. So that's a long tenure. So thanks Jeff for, for your contributions. Tazina, you um, just a dynamo on campus and off, and off campus. And Tazine was hired to be an Arabic instructor at the college, but has also doubled as my counselor some, for some reason. I don't know how that happened, but Thank you, Tazine, for all of your input and all of your help, especially on a personal level. Thank you so much. Um, Tessa Betts, our co-chair, what I, what I really appreciate about Tessa is um, 
when we were on campus, I was stopped by Tesla's office to vent a lot about just, you know, all of my craziness. And she would never kick me out. She would always be patient. She would always listen to me. And um, she brought those same qualities to the committee, very patient, listening, considerate, and leading. So thank you, Tessa, for everything that you've done. Shauna Simpson Singleton, I mean, Shauna, um, we lost Shauna to Wayne State, you know, because she just brings so much to the table. They said, we can't do without this woman. Um, but Shauna has done so much. She's an alum of Henry Ford, and she's worked tirelessly to, to make this college um, a great place and make it into the place that she envisions it. So thank you, Shauna, for all of your contributions, not only to this committee, but to all of the committees that you've been on, all the work you've been doing with the focus group, with the Black Employee Association, everything, and finding time to teach math too while you were doing that. So, you know, thanks for everything, Shauna, appreciate you. And Vanita, Vanita, <laughs> Vanita Parekh, I have to give a, a lot of special credit to Vanita because Vanita is supposed to have ended her term as, as one of our pick co-chairs back in January at the conclusion of our January pick. But because we're doing this, she has been staying on and she's been doing double duty and Vanita, we really appreciate all of your leadership that you've offered and, and you've been great. It's wonderful working with you. you, you you're, you're the best, Vanita. So thank you, every, thank you very much. And thanks to all of you. Um, and then finally, thanks to everyone here. Thank you for, for showing up today. This is not a mandatory session. So that means you decided that this was important enough to be here today, to spend your time, to, to get uncomfortable to learn some things, to be open about some things. Um, and everything that we do, including today, to, to, to address the issues that, that we know are, are, are prevalent. You know, and, and this isn't just a HFC thing, but we're, we're talking about us today and how we can get better. So whatever we can do to combat racism, inequity, injustice, exclusionary practices, you, that means we're moving in the right direction. So thank you for taking time to be here today. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce our speaker today and the next voice that you will hear will be from our keynote speaker. The title of today's conference is Social Justice and Equity in Education. A college's responsibility to its community in the face of a litany of black deaths. And I'm excited to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. D.L. Stewart. Dr. Stewart is a professor in the School of Education, co-coordinator of student affairs and higher education, co-director of CSU initiatives of the race for the race and intersectional studies for Educational Equity Center, and affiliated faculty in the Center for Women's Studies and Gender Research at Colorado State University. Over the course of his career, he has focused most intently on the history and philosophy of higher education, as well as institutional systems and structures that affect the post-secondary experiences, growth and development, as well as success of racially minoritized and queer and trans students. Dr. Stewart examines these topics through intersectional, critical, and post-structural frameworks that incorporate ableism, religious hegemony and classism alongside racism, patriarchy, and queer and trans antagonism. In addition to over 50 journal publications and book chapters, DL is an author or editor of four books, most recently, Black Collegians Experiences in U.S. Northern Private Colleges, A Narrative History, 1945 to 1965, and co-editor on Rethinking College Student Development Theory Using Critical Frameworks. Dr. Stewart. Thank you so much um, for that introduction. Thank you to uh, Chardon and Benita and Shauna, um, who were part of the, the small subset of the PIC committee for bringing me here, for extending the invitation, 
and bringing me here. Many thanks to the PIC committee um, for your work and many, many thanks to the institution for supporting this event. Um, as was introduced, I'm DL Stewart. My pronouns are he, him, and they, them. I am visiting with you from the lands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and, and peoples, and where the Kiowa, Cheyenne, and Lakota also lived and hunted. It's important for me to acknowledge the land that I am on um, because this is part of the violence um, of settler colonialism that is baked into the history of colleges and universities throughout this country. Colorado State University is a land grant institution and owes its presence right, to the um, forced removal and attempted genocide of native peoples in this part of the country through the Morrill Land Grant Act. Right? So it's important for me to acknowledge that I am a settler on this land um, and that the work that I do, it comes, came at a dire cost to indigenous peoples. We're gonna be talking today, um, I'm focusing specifically on black students. It is still Black History Month. Um, so I am focusing in this talk particularly on black students. However, much of what I am going to share really does apply across the global majority that is in the United States and on our college campuses, okay? So I am going to begin sharing my screen. You should also see there at the bottom of, um, of the screen here, uh, subtitles running. Uh, it is an automatic like AI technology. And so it is not exactly perfect, but hopefully this will be helpful um, to those um, who are with us today. And thank you so much to all of you for coming in. I saw on the chat um, as folks were, were, were mingling before we got started, people talking about, you know, this is a day full of Zooms, Zoom, 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 Zoom. I have a close friend who talks about going into Zoom land at work. Um, in her in her office in just one meeting after the other. And so I very much appreciate um, those all of you for taking the time to put one more Zoom uh, meeting and session into your schedule to learn and talk about um, these very important issues. So this talk today is titled A College's Response to um, a litany of Black death. And so I want to start with honoring some of that here. These are not all of the pictures I could have put up, which is sad and unfortunate, right? It's a tragedy that there are so many more that could not fit on this screen. But I do want to lift up some of these names that you probably have heard of other names that perhaps you have not. Um, and if I say a name that you don't know, I encourage you to go look up their story, right? And what happened. I'm gonna start with Elijah McLean. Elijah McLean uh, was here in Colorado. Um, I wanna point that out. I won't say that for everybody where they are, but I do wanna talk particularly and acknowledge that Elijah McLean uh, was here outside of Denver, okay? A uh, young man, 25 years old, uh, who lost his life. Brianna Taylor, okay? Next to Tatiana Jefferson. Next to Tatiana is Renisha McBride. And then Sandra Bland. In the bottom row, we have George Floyd. Walter, Walter Wallace, Mike Brown, and Ahmaud Arbery. The anniversary of his death um, last February was this Tuesday. As we think and hold, I just wanna take a moment to have us take in these names 
and the many more that I could have shared. Black lives lost, many of these to police violence, others to vigilante, renegade, uh, white terrorism uh, committed by those who did not have a badge, such as in the case of Ahmad. This is who I want to center in this talk today, this litany of Black death and the Black lives that existed before them. So where's the lesson in that? One of them is that any of them could have been students at any college or university, but particularly also could have been students at Henry Ford, right? Many of them, like Mike Brown, was headed to community college, to a two-year institution after high school. He was killed in that time, the summer between graduating from high school and entering college. And he was headed, as I understand, to a two-year institution. But any of them could have been students at Henry Ford. That range of ages, right? That range of occupations, the range of um, life experiences, any of them could have been in community colleges, in two-year institutions at Henry Ford. And so the question is, is this our business? We might be asking, well, is this our business that these lives have been lost and so many others? Why, what does this have to do with us? So I'm gonna talk about that today. I'm gonna invite you to consider as I do, what is your relationship to them and to their communities? And then what might be your response? So that's where we're going. And so I encourage you to hold those questions in your mind. Is this our business? What is our relationship to them, to their community? What is going to be our response? Okay. And so in thinking about those, I want to first orient us around what is college to the black student, right? And so you might see threaded through my talk today, themes that came through the pre-reading um, that was sent to you and many thanks to those of you who had, it, had um, the opportunity, were able to take the opportunity to read um, those articles. If you did not, not a problem, you won't be lost. I promise you, you won't be lost. So what is college to the black student? Okay. Most enter post-secondary education through two-year institutions and community colleges, right? So when we think about black students in the United States, the majority of them come through community colleges and two-year institutions on their pathway through higher education, okay? Many of them, this is, this is the entirety of their college education will happen in two-year institutions like Henry Ford. They often, as is the case for many students at two-year institutions, have responsibilities beyond just being a student, right? Families, uh, whether that be taking care of elderly parents, having a partner, having children, taking care of someone else's children as their own, working part-time, full-time, right? They often have responsibilities beyond just being a student. And so what is college to the Black student? It may be a means to a better income. I'm here, I'm engaged in education, perhaps particularly career and technical education, but also in um, the general arts and sciences as a means, perhaps hoping to transfer to a four-year institution, all of this, whichever direction, whichever wing um, they are sitting in within the institution, perhaps they're seeing this as a means to a better income. 
college perhaps may be a, seen as a place to learn, right? I'm here because I'm curious about the world around me. I'm curious about questions of society, right? Of science, of math, of English, of history. I'm looking for a place where I can learn, learn about myself, I can learn about others. We were talking um, before the session started with, uh, with the, the PIC committee about the hunger for connection that is becoming so much more um, apparent during the time that we're living in of this global pandemic. And college provides a place and a space for community, right? Learning about self, learning about others in the context of community, in class, outside of class, on the way to class, right? A space for community. But what else is college to the Black student? And many racially minoritized students, many students who are part of the global majority on historically white campuses. Well, college to the Black student can also be hostile territory. Hostility in institutional policies and practices, hostility in the classroom, hostility in, in that classroom, sometimes coming from faculty, but also sometimes coming from their fellow students. Hostility going from one place to the next on campus, hostility faced um, by encounters perhaps with campus security or police, uh, systems, hostile territory, some place where there are perhaps landmines that one doesn't expect to run into, and all of a sudden, here you are, you step on that pressure plate and perhaps are frozen in place. Sometimes college to the Black student is a confusing maze of policies and bureaucracy sometimes don't make any sense, right? And this is not exclusive to two-year institutions, right? <laughs> any of these things, none of these things are exclusive to two-year institutions at all. A confusing maze, policies, practices. This happens this way in one class. It happens in an entirely different way in another class. I'm having different kinds of experiences in different parts of campus with different people on campus. And this is confusing. I want to transfer. And the articulation agreements are perhaps confusing for me to figure out. You know, I need help. Working my way through this maze. I have some place I'm trying to go. I have a career that I want to commit to. I have a family I need to take care of. I have myself that I need to take care of. But this, this place can be a maze and a confusing one. Sometimes to the Black student, college is a waste of time, right? So if we just be honest, sometimes it's seen this is a waste of time because it's confusing, because it's hostile, right? because I feel like I don't belong. I don't see enough people that look like me, think like me, have background experiences like me around me. I'm not seeing it in my fellow students. Perhaps I'm not seeing it in the faculty and staff. I'm not seeing it in the senior administration of my institution. And so maybe this is just a waste of time. Maybe this is a waste of time because I know I'm aware of the ways that structural racism operates. And I know I could put all of this effort into pursuing this degree, pursuing this training, pursuing this education, and go out into the workforce and run into structural systemic racism that pushes me down in the career, in the labor market to a level where I know I'm more talented that, I know I've got education beyond that, I know that something is wrong. 
something is amiss here. And so why should I bother with college if I'm not going to get the job that actually college qualified me for because of racism, right? And racism intersected with other systems of oppression. Perhaps college to the black student is a waste of time because the loans, I can't handle them. Even perhaps at a two-year institution where it is far more affordable than going to a four-year state institution, let alone a private institution, but perhaps I can't afford even that. Perhaps I am so loan averse that I, and combined with my awareness of how race and racism works in this country, this is perhaps not worth it. And so what is our responsibility? Is this our business? Okay. What is college to the Black student? What is the Black student to the college? Is the other side of that coin that we have to flip and we have to look at? What is the Black student to the college? Well, in, in one of those pieces that was sent out, Twisted at the Roots, I talk about the ways that colleges and universities were not designed for black students or really for any student who defied the mythic norm of whiteness, patriarchy, and wealth. That is who colleges and universities were established for, right? You can go back to 1636 to Harvard. So we're coming on 400 years soon here of higher education in the land that would become the United States. Again, land stolen from indigenous people. Colleges and universities were not designed for anybody that wasn't white, wealthy, a man, Christian, heterosexual, cisgender, and now we have these, the whole, those groups in colleges and universities, not designed for those who are disabled. And now we have people with disabilities in our colleges and universities that were not designed for them, okay? We have the recognition, right, that two-year institutions rose up, the junior college, the first one being founded outside Chicago, Illinois, um, junior colleges rose up in response in many ways to that exclusion in the four-year university college system, right? So we got to acknowledge that in many ways, that is what community colleges, two-year institutions are founded on is access, right? Founded on the principle that the community should have a college, right? And yet, even in those spaces, these exclusions, exclusionary practices, exclusionary systems are still operating, right? So what is the black student to the college? Perhaps that student is seen as an interloper and a misfit. What are you doing here? You don't belong here. Why are you here? Okay. That's the program you wanna go into? Mm, I'm not sure that you fit in that program. Maybe you should go to this program instead because I don't see you as fitting in to my conceptualization of the student who belongs in that space. Perhaps to the college, the black student is seen as unlikely to succeed, okay? May be here, yeah, we'll let you go into that program, but I don't know. How much, how many resources should we really invest 
and that student into this population of students if they're just probably not likely to succeed. I mean, the statistics tell us they're not likely to succeed. And so maybe they don't deserve as much attention, okay? Maybe in the way that we actually give them attention, we are reinforcing the idea that they're unlikely to succeed. Perhaps to the college, the black student is antagonistic. They come with too many demands. They come into this space, maybe they think they're better. They're just this antagonism to the whole system, questioning everything. Right? And why are they questioning everything? These other students don't do that. Why do these students have to question how we do things here? Perhaps to the college, the Black student is just angry and hostile themselves. They're angry. They're hostile. We don't know, what, we don't know how to deal with them, and we don't want to deal with them. Along that same line, perhaps that black student is just threatening. You know, this, this black man is really tall, it's really big, it's a very deep voice. I don't know, maybe I'm just threatened by that student. I need to keep them at arm's length. What is the black student to the college? Is, it, is that student a diversity badge? Right, where we can say and we can put on our publications, we can flash on our website, these beautiful black and brown faces, but that's all they are is a diversity badge so that we can say and um, proclaim to the world, the rest of the places that see, we're more diverse than you are. We've got all of this diversity on our campus and stop there. Is the black student a diversity badge? Questions to think about. How do we think about black students and other members of the global majority on our campuses? Is this our business? What do we wanna do about it? What should we do about it? How should we react? So let's talk a bit, how do we untwist these roots, right? Because this, this is all baked in, it's all baked in to the foundations of our institutions. Some would say even, and I would agree, baked into the idea of education itself and what higher education specifically should be about and who it should be for. So a college and its community. I think particularly for community colleges, because the word community is in the identity, the descriptor of the institution, being in community. What does that mean? Who is in your community? The, community, the local community, I'm not talking about the community on the campus, although that is also a relevant question there. But who is in your local community? the land that the institution sits on, who surrounds it, right? Where are your students traveling in from? That's part of the local community too, even if they're not in the immediate neighborhood of the institution. So who is there? What do we know about them? What do we know about their lives? What do we know about their struggles? What do we know about how they likely have to engage with social service systems in the community that they live in. What are they bringing with them to college, into the classroom, into having to deal with the bursar and the registrar's office? What are we seeing? What are we hearing? What are we learning? Okay. This is part of what it means to be in community. 
to think about who is around us. Are there differences between who is on our campus and who is in the local community? And where are those differences? Who's missing from our campus spaces? And where are they if they're not with us? How are we serving, right? Again, community college is often based on the entire idea of service to the local community. How are we doing that? How well are we doing that? And which communities are we doing it for? Right? Because that's the reality. The communities outside of our, that surround our institutions, the communities from which our students come to us are not monolithic. They're not. They are diverse in demographic identities, in where they're, in, in the nature of their relationship to the social safety net in relationship to politics, local, state, and federal. So who's missing from our community and where are they? What are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you learning? How do we think about ourselves and recognize the ways that we may be functioning as an institution, as a cog in the machine? Right. Here I'm drawing on uh, L. Uh, Paperson's work, um, Law Paperson's work, and his book is a very small book called A Third University is Possible. Okay. It's a phenomenal text. It's literally like 70 pages. Um, and La Paperson says a lot in 70 papers in 70 pages. Okay. I'll put the name of that book and the author in the chat after I'm done because the closed captioning is the subtitling rather is not getting the author's name correct. Okay. So I will put that in the chat after I'm done. You, the book title is correct, but the author's name is not, it's not showing up correctly. But in this text, La Paperson discusses the first university, the second university, the third university. And in that first university, right, and this, even in the second university, they are still grounded in ideas of white supremacy, of the white, the white students, and white um, grounded education as the standard by which everything else is measured and which everything else is compared, right? Still founded in legacies of settler colonialism and practices, current practices, not just legacies of settler colonialism, right? The third university, however, is different. And there are ways that the third university is actually still is still showing up despite all of that all of that other stuff is still showing up and is still disrupting and putting a wedge in the machine, right? To keep it from functioning the way it usually does. And so when we think about the cog in the machine and the institution as the, the cog in the larger machine of societal um, foundations in racism, in classism, in ableism, in patriarchy, okay, in queer and trans antagonism, institutions sit within that machine and can be a cog that helps that machine turn, okay? Part of being that cog are legacies of discipline and education as a, dis a disciplinary tool. There are researchers who look at the K-12 environment and see the ways that discipline 
is the predominant force of education, particularly in schools and specifically in schools that are have majority black and brown children in them. Okay. That the emphasis is put on getting students into shape and making sure students follow the rules and in having a lot of rules that discipline them to behave in a certain way, to think about themselves in a certain way, okay? How might these legacies of discipline still be present in colleges? How do we see rules and the application of rules, right? Be disparately directed at black and brown students. I was talking with one of my advisees in our doctoral program in higher education leadership at CSU yesterday. And she works in residence life. So she's at a four-year institution with, um, that is a residential campus. So it has residence halls and students living in residence halls. And um, there are rules that govern how students are supposed to behave and live in those spaces. One of those rules is that the smoke detector in the room cannot be covered up, okay? Sensible, right? Don't cover the smoke detector. If you are caught covering the smoke detector, the penalty is being kicked out of the residence hall in three days, okay? You have to leave the residence hall in three days. These students are not predominantly commuter students. They may live somewhat close to the, to the area of the city that the campus, the institution is located in, but somewhat close may still be three, four, five hours. A majority of their students are not from out of state, but a significant number of their students perhaps are from Chicago or St. Louis which as I said, is still several hours away. They get put out in the middle of the semester, where are they going to go? You have a student who immediately becomes homeless, right? And unhoused, excuse me, who becomes unhoused, right? This policy, as, as my student was telling me, this policy, has a disproportionate impact and is unevenly applied to black students. Because here's, here's the direction, here, here is like how things roll out, okay? Um, and my, my student told me that in her institution, typically this violation is discovered because a room check is happening for something completely unrelated. Okay. Um, and so the resident assistant, another student may discover um, on a check for something else that the smoke detector is covered. The policy states that that student must call the police, the campus police to come. The campus police come and they have the discretion to write a citation or not for that student. Sometimes um, the, my student told me that um, in her role, what she hears, uh, she's a professional, she's a full-time professional, um, in her role, she hears that, well, the reason the officer didn't issue a citation is because the student was nice about it and they understood it was wrong. And so the officer has the discretion 
whether or not to write up a citation. Now think about what you know about how Black students and Black people interact and how the police, I should say it this way, how the police interact with Black people. Who do you think is more likely to get a citation? Who do you think gets the most citations for covering up the smoke detector? Now, let's think about the context in which this happens. One student um, was given a citation. It rose up to the levels, had to be terminated from um, living in the residence hall because she covered up the smoke detector because she was doing her hair. She was flat ironing her hair. Those of you who may be familiar with flat ironing hair may know that sometimes that creates, because of the other products involved, that may create a lot of smoke that could set off in a very small space, could set off a smoke alarm. That's why the student, a Black student, a Black woman, covered the smoke detector. So it wouldn't go off while she was doing her hair. She had every intention of uncovering the smoke detector when she was done. That student had to be terminated, had her residence hall contract terminated. In doing so, students who are in this way um, expelled from housing have to pay 50% of their housing bill. If you think about Black students on college campuses, often, not exclusively, but many times are coming from lower income households where there's not a whole lot of financial flexibility. They're responsible for 50% of the housing bill. All of this is disproportionately falling on Black students. But upper leadership, senior leadership, in uh, the housing department doesn't see a problem, doesn't see that anything needs to be changed. If stuck on, well, that's the policy, one, and two, they could have, you know, there could be a fire. And so therefore, this is totally reasonable to give people three days to exit the halls. This is a legacy of discipline that's still present at that institution. How might other legacies of discipline be present at your institution, right? And so when we think about preparation and education as a preparation, what are we preparing them for? Preparation for what, right? When we think about the technical skills they may be pursuing, what is happening in the larger community, right, in terms of the conditions, the structural conditions of those jobs, of those careers, okay? What are we preparing them for? Are we preparing them for sub-living wage labor? And is that our business? Should we be doing something about that? Should we be saying something about that? Preparation for what? There's a German concept, um, left for height and learn from height, right? That talk about uh, respectively the right to teach and the right to learn, okay? How is that happening? How is that showing up in your institution? How's the right to teach coming up? To teach to people, not just to the subject. How was the right to learn showing up, right? Not just to learn rote material, but to learn about themselves, about others, about the society they live within, about their responsibilities and opportunities and rights as citizens. The right to teach, the right to learn. How is that being enabled? at your institution? How is that perhaps being closed off at your institution so that the cog and the machine keep working together? 
So I talked about in the description of talking about in affirming, empowering um, students, right? And so what does it look like? What might it look like to affirm, right? And if we think about the, um, the literal Webster dictionary, Merriam-Webster, Oxford English Dictionary definitions of affirm, we see things that are relevant and are appropriate for institutions. We can talk about the right to an education, affirming a student's right to an education that is humanizing and life-giving. We can think about a, a firm, uh, to affirm our students as support, right? How do we support them? How do we uphold them? How do we defend them, right? And so let's think about defending our students as an act of affirmation. What does that look like, right? Think about affirmation as giving and giving a heightened sense of value, right? How do we show through our institutional policies and practices through um, our pedagogy and andragogy in the classroom, how do we show a heightened sense of value as they interact across the campus with administrators, with faculty, with the uh, policies and practices, the procedures of the institution? How are they giving a heightened sense of value? Are they giving students a heightened sense of value? Empower, let's do the same thing with the concept of empowering our students. Here, it would give, educate, control, and claim are some of the key words that I pulled out. Giving authority or power. And, and, and let me step back for a moment. We have to be careful about using the word empower, right? I'm going to empower you. For some of you may, rec may be recognizing, ooh, something about that just doesn't feel right doesn't sound right. Empower, I'm going to empower someone else, right? In a sense that almost strips that person's power if we are not careful about how we use it. This is one of the problems I see with um, when people talk about giving voice to someone else. You can't give someone a voice. They already have a voice. How can you amplify that voice? Right. So here when I'm talking about empowering, I'm not, I'm trying to avoid this really creepy, um, <laughs> uh, icky kind of way of talking about, I'm going to empower you. Okay. But rather, how do we give students the authority or the power over their own lives and their own education? How could that happen? How could we educate them for strength and confidence? How could we educate them to be able to control their life and their life circumstances, to be able to know how the systems and the structures operate so that they can control their lives, so that they can claim their rights? This is how we can put empowerment in action in a way that's not paternalistic, right? But actually engages in a process of, um, not just power sharing, right, with our students, but also giving up the power and the authority that we may hold and may want to retain. How do we give up power, okay, to our students? And then this idea of advocating, right? It talked about how can we advocate Advocating really talks about publicly supporting and recommending a cause or policy. What's the role of the institution? What's the role for us as individual people in our roles within the institution? Because I recognize I may be talking to folk who don't have system-wide, institutional-wide authority to change things. But each of you have a sphere of influence, okay? Each of you have a sphere of influence. Within your sphere of influence, how can you publicly support and recommend a cause or a policy within the institution, beyond the institution? How are you engaged perhaps in letters to the editor, right? How are you engaged in showing up at city council? How are you engaged, okay, in helping students 
learn how, like I said before, the system works. Okay. Whose side are you on? Are you on the side of your institution? Are you on the side of the society? Are you on the side of your students? Whose side are you on? Who are you advocating for? And what are you advocating? I think these are important questions that go back to the beginning when I ask, is this our business? My answer to that question is an unequivocal yes, this is our business. How do we publicly support our students? How do we publicly recommend a cause or a policy that can improve the lives and the education of our students, right? How do we situate ourselves on the side of justice, on the side of equity, okay? I think I have a little bit more time left and so I'm going to move, um, move kind of quickly through here. Um, through this next piece so that we still have time for discussion. So resisting appeasement, how do we move forward toward transformation? And I got a handful of questions ahead of time and several of them have to do with what I'm gonna talk about here in this section, okay? So resisting appeasement. One of the questions was, well, why do institutions um, why are they, why do they use? Why is it so easy for people to use these euphemisms instead of talking about and getting, really getting down and dirty into the work, right? So my entering assumptions, I think about that question are that people want to do good work. They do. People want to do good work. People are doing the best they can most of the time. That doesn't mean they're doing good work. It means they're doing the best they can most of the time with what they know and with what tools they have. People are guided by the tacit assumptions they have internalized about what the problem is as well as what the solution might be, okay? You take all three of those together, sometimes you can end up in a world of hurt. Sometimes you take all three of those together and you can end up in a world of help, okay? People's tacit assumptions differ, right? So those underlying assumptions about what the problem is and what the solution might be vary. There are 200 people in this space, sharing space together right now. And there may very well be 200 different tacit assumptions about what the problem is and what the solution might be. And then my entering assumption is that those who are the most impacted need to be centered in the conversations about equity and justice. So as we move toward equity and justice, it's important to re realize we're talking about a continuum, not a binary. It's not just either or. It's a continuum and it's a continuum that actually works together, which we'll see here in a moment. An institutional focus on diversity and inclusion focuses on how far we've come and what we're doing right now. How far we've come, what we're doing right now. A focus on diversity and inclusion ultimately ends up maintaining the status quo, okay? Because the underlying foundations, the assumptions that guide what the policy is and how it should be enforced that guide what education should look like and how it should be taught, that guide how students should be engaged on campus and what we do to encourage that never gets questioned. How far have we come to being able to keep things the way they are, but adding more, as I say um, in this article in, in Inside Higher Ed with doing add, you know, add sugar and stir. Okay. A critical focus within an institution on equity and justice, however, asks inherently different questions. Where are we going and what yet needs to be done? Where are we going and what yet needs to be done? This focus seeks to subvert and reorder the status quo. To go back to that text, a third university is possible. This is what La Paperson is talking about 
in the third university. It is, it is subverting and reordering the status quo by asking, well, where are we going? Where is it we need to get to? And what do we need to do to get there? Okay. And so how might these work together? Sometimes people think, well, this is like a step ladder, right? So if we do diversity, then we can get inclusion, then we can do equity, and then we can move toward justice. And, and we just walk down the, or walk up the steps, walk down the steps um, that way, All right? So perhaps I should have this flip so that justice is at the top step and diversity is at the bottom step. But regardless, as we move forward, Sometimes people think, well, we, if we can't, if the people aren't here, so they're thinking about the compositional diversity of the space. If the people aren't here, then we can't do inclusion because we have to have the people here in order to be inclusive. And until we can be inclusive, then we can't really work equity because we need the people here to be inclusive, to be equitable toward them. And then we can talk about justice. Right. And that's not quite how I see this working. I think they operate more um, cyclically, right? More of a cycle where you can start, I think, anywhere on this in the conversation and move through and continually reinforce an equitable campus that has policies and practices that are equitable is inherently going to become more diverse. It inherently requires inclusion, okay? A campus that forwards justice as part of its, its mission and its orientation, its philosophical orientation is automatically going to do things that are going to increase diversity, that are going to value and center inclusion, that are going to um, show up in equitable policy practice, pedagogy, andragogy as well, okay? So they can work together, they need to work together, but they are really a continuum of orientation, right? They don't sit in the same place. Diversity and inclusion and equity and justice ask qualitatively different questions, okay? But all of those questions are necessary right, to bring an institution forward, right, toward transformation. So I talked about um, in, a, in, a, in another chapter that I wrote that's related to um, the short op-ed essay, Eight Proposals for Policy and Practice. I won't go through all of them in the interest of time, but in these eight proposals, I'm going to talk about a couple of them and put them all up and then go back. I want to look at number two, valuing minoritized voices, right? Valuing the voices of people who have been subjected, right, to um, minority status, right? Valuing minoritized voices, that means making their issues and their perspective on those issues at the center of the conversation in such a way that they are driving how the conversation goes, right? When we value minoritized voices, we make sure that they are present in the room, that the room is centered around them, right? That we could say we take the room to them, Instead of trying to get them to come to us, we go to them. That's how we value minoritized voices. We, uh, we look at uh, number three, rejecting the traditional norm. In that traditional norm, you know, that says this is how we've always done this, right? So think about the ways and the times you've heard, perhaps have even said, this is how this is always done. This is how we've always done it. It works and we're not changing it. Well, who is it working for? Okay. So we pair number three with number eight, reversing disparate policy effects, right? Means thinking about who is the traditional war norm working for? 
okay? It's not working for everybody. It's having policy effects that land disproportionately on some students than others. Like the example I gave before of the smoke alarm policy. Okay. How can we reverse those effects, not just stop them, right? So often a policy, a bad policy that's having disproportionate, inequitable outcomes is changed. Awesome. That's great. Let's do that. Change the policy. But there are already other people who were subjected to that policy before it was changed, who are still living with the disparate effects of them. We need to reverse those effects as well. It's similar to the conversation that often happens in circles uh, surrounding the legalization of marijuana, right? This is wonderful, this is great. It removes not just the stigma, but also the criminality, right? Of engaging in this uh, practice, in this habit, okay? And um, so it reduces that, it, it, get, it gets rid of that, it doesn't just reduce, it gets rid of that, stops sending people um, to jail, it stops you know, contributing to the overpopulation of our prisons. But, so people in the future won't be harmed by this, but what about the people who already have criminal records due to marijuana use and distribution that are preventing them from being able to get a job, that are preventing them in some cases of being able to get an education, that are preventing them from perhaps finding a place to live because they have a criminal record. That's a disparate policy effect that needs to be reversed, not just stopped for the future, okay? So if we think about these kinds of proposals for policy and practice, uh, institutional leaders, what might institutional leaders need to be doing? How, then, how can they step in to enact these uh, different sets of policies and practices? And again, I'm just going to put all 10 up um, and then talk about a couple of these. One is that we've got to commit to the personal work. What do we need to do for ourselves? Okay, about our thinking, about our behavior, okay? the knowledge that we have or don't have, we need to commit to that personal work. I talk in number two about getting equity mentors, okay? So who is striving, right? Because let's move away from getting it right to who is striving, right, for continual transformation, right? Continual work, continual improvement. It's a journey not a destination, who are our equity mentors? Who are people who can, number three, help us get accountable, okay? I wish I, wish I had time to talk about every single one of these, but um, because they're all related, but um, I wanna pull out number nine and number 10 um, because they kind of relate to questions that came in beforehand. Number nine, realizing the limits of interest convergence. So interest convergence is a wonderful um, construct developed by Derek Bell. Um, many of you probably are aware of interest convergence, but I'm just gonna say it just in case there are folks in the room who are unfamiliar with this concept. Interest convergence basically says it's a part of critical race theory that um, for instance, an institution, a predominantly white institution um, I'll, actually, I'll use an actual historical example. The passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965 is an example of interest convergence. How? Because the U.S. at the time, in, in from the 50s, particularly from the 50s into the 60s, where the U.S. was inserting itself into international politics, okay, um, people in, in the United Nations was re were realizing, oh, the US has some hypocrisy here around these issues of human rights. The passage of the 64 and 65 legislation actually helped improve the US image around the world, helped it be able to say, yo, 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 we're doing 
we're, we're working on this, okay? And yet we have the laws in place. We are 50, over 50 years later, right? And we are still dealing with many of the same issues that were supposed to be addressed by the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. The limits of interest convergence. There's an example right there. Okay. One of the questions that came in was, was how do we get um, folks who are um, those most impacted into the center of the conversation without tokenizing them and exploiting them for their labor? Excellent question. Okay. We need to be aware of that. Well, in number 10, I suggest, well, appoint a compensated advisory board of those most impacted. Compensate them. Compensation does not always just look like money, even though money is good, right? But there are other ways. How can you engage with people to find out for them what would be um, comp what would be fair compensation for their time? What could be done? Even if it's not financial, what could be done to compensate and recognize the labor that they are putting in to help the institution do better? Okay. So that's, that's what I've got. I'm going to stop here, um, unshare or stop sharing my screen. Um, we have a little bit of time, I think, for conversation um, and questions that may, other questions that may come forward. Um, and while folks are having time and, and the, the chat is being turned back on, um, there was another, another couple of questions that I got that I, I'll go ahead and start with as folks are thinking perhaps. Um, one of them asked, well, are there, oh, thank you, Rhonda, for putting that in the chat. Um, one, one question was, well, are there other, are there historically white institutions that are getting this right, okay, so that we can learn from them, right? It's a wonderful idea, wonderful aspiration. I'm going to say two things. One is, you know, whenever I'm actually asked that question a lot, as you might imagine, and I often, I, I, I'm stumped. I'm usually stumped. I can't think of anybody. Okay. And so I went to Twitter and said, okay, help me out here. Who do you know? Who do you know? Who's out there? Is there anybody who's getting this right? You know, any historically white institutions getting this quote unquote right? That's the second thing I'll come back to. And response after response after response are people saying, I don't, I, I don't know, not run across such an institution. I'm not sure one exists. I'm not sure it's possible. One person even said, right? So a suggestion was thrown out um, for a certain institution and somebody else who had worked at that institution said, uh-uh, no, not them not them, okay? Another institution was put out, somebody else said, uh-uh, no, not them either, okay? So there is nobody who has achieved the pinnacle, likely, you know, and then talk to everybody, there, perhaps there is, but I highly doubt it, that there's an institution who has reached the pinnacle, okay, of, oh, we're, we're doing it, we, we've got it, we are doing equity and justice all across our institution, Yes, not there. But I would encourage you perhaps to not be disillusioned by that, okay? But rather reorient the goal from getting it right to continually striving, okay? Because there's never gonna be a point where you get it right all the time. It's just not gonna happen. We're humans. And so therefore we make mistakes, okay? We get it wrong. We have to apologize. We have to go back. We have to fix it. Every single one of us, me included, okay? As an institution, what we need to do 
is to recognize that that is going to happen and commit ourselves to owning our mistakes, learning how to do better. And then the next time that situation comes up, we don't make the same mistake again. The next time another situation comes up that's related to it, we don't make that mistake again, right? So it's, it's about not making the same mistake twice, okay? Which is, you know, somewhat difficult. I think one of the reasons why people can't think of an institution who is consistently on this path is because institutional leadership changes over, okay? Other administrators within the institution change over. Faculty change over. The students who are there absolutely change over. And so at any given moment, you will have an entirely different campus than you did five years prior, 10 years prior, definitely 50 years prior. And so keeping the momentum becomes very difficult. Institutional leadership is so crucial in this conversation, but it's not just inter institutional leadership. It also has to happen from the ground up. But institutional leadership, the way the academy is set up, right, are the folks who perhaps have the most influence, the board of trustees or board of directors has probably the, and the president have the most influence in changing things, right? But sometimes what we learn is we've made great progress as an institution. We are, yes, we are making strides. We're seeing the change happen and it's positive. And then that president leaves, right? That president leaves and it all falls apart. And we're left, those who are left realize, oh, wow, oh, so it was the, charisma, it was the initiatives that that person did that helped us get there, but now they're gone. And none of that was put into the institutional infrastructure in a way that prevents it from being undone by the new president. Okay. So that's the challenge. That's why some of these issues are so intractable, okay? Because it's very difficult to, I, I like to say sometimes hardwire, right? Change. Because a lot of this ends up depending on a charismatic leader, on an administrator who has been there for 20 years and has been able to work consistently to make those changes and then that leader retires. And the replace the person who is then hired into that role doesn't have the same consciousness, or if they do, doesn't have the same relationships that allowed that up the previous person to be able to make all this change. Okay. And that's where the challenge comes in. Right. Um, another question was, well, wait, what about um, how can we get white people to listen to this? Right. So this is great stuff. I agree. Yes. How do we get the white people to listen? Is there somebody who can who can talk white people speak who they'll listen to to get this so that they will hear it? Because maybe is it is it that white people will more likely listen to other white people? Right. And if that's the case, so, so who, who speaks white people speak that we can bring in and, and have them share? to a white audience. What I have experienced is that generally white people will listen to other white people. Privilege meets privilege, right? Um, people who are heterosexual will listen more to people, other people who are heterosexual about um, sexuality and heterosexism, right? It's, it's, I think that's part of the dynamic, a part of the way that people operate is that they listen, they are more willing to be challenged to folks that look like them, that come from their same backgrounds, right? 
um, because they don't put all of, they don't come with all of the baggage that they put on somebody else who comes in, right? I think that's part of human nature. And so there are white people out there. There are anti-racist white people out there who do speaking, who does training, who does, you know, et cetera, um, who you could bring in, right? Absolutely. The issue is that anybody that comes in one time is only going to have a one-time impact. They're not necessarily going to be able to sustain the impact simply because one person came in and gave a training or gave a talk. So how, again, are you hardwiring perpetual learning into the system? Okay. Um, all right, I see a question in the chat. Should the college form a committee of employees and underrepresented students so we can work together to create change and help transform the college for the better? Or create a survey to ask students, what do you feel would help you the most? I would say you do both, both. Right. So one thing we have to recognize is that whoever the members of that community, that committee are, can't speak for the entirety of all the people that are like them on that campus. Right. You may have you could have 20 black students on that committee. Right. Those 20 black students will never be able to represent all the black students on your campus. OK. And so how can you get in more information, more data? from a larger group of students, from a larger group of employees that the committee can then work with and the committee that is representative, all right, um, of the campus who can then use that data and folks on the committee who perhaps have had similar experiences can help give, um, can help flesh out, right? This is what, this, this, is, this, this is what this is talking about, right? Because the numbers on the survey only tell you so much, right? Experiences and stories matter, right? So I would add another step in, in, in there, and that is having focus groups, having community conversations. I have um, a, a friend who I work, I'm working with actually on a committee um, related to this at a non-academic um, non space. And he says, you know, I don't like the term focus group. It sounds so sterile. I don't like that. What about how can we have community conversations? Right? How can we have community conversations? And so what are the community conversations that you can organize on your campus? Ooh. Oh, wait, there was a question. Let me scroll up. All right. As an institution, I'm not saying out people's names because I don't know if you want your name set out um, out loud, but as an institution, we are tied both in name and history to Henry Ford, a known anti-Semite and racist. Yep. His influence laid a template for the segregation of our region. Absolutely it did. What steps would you suggest the college take to acknowledge and address this? Well, um, there's a real obvious one, right? And that is organizing to have the name changed. Why have this person's name continue to be attached to this institution? Because that legacy is probably walking with the institution, even though that person is no longer alive, even though the institution is likely no longer engaging in those kinds of policies and practices. There are for some folks in the community who still remember, right? Henry Ford back then, not just the person, but the institution. Okay. So how can you organize? to have the name changed, right? This is the movement about taking down statues, replacing Confederate flags, changing the names on buildings. This all comes into the same, um, into the, into the, this is all the same conversation, right? History belongs in museum. It doesn't have to stay on our institutions. It doesn't have to stay on our buildings, right? And so I, I think that's, that's a key step, acknowledging this is the history of our institution. This is the legacy of this person brings to this institution and to this region. And here's what we're going to address it. We are going to change the name, right? We are going to help root out. We are going as an institution 
how can we reverse the desperate of the disparate effects of Henry Ford's philosophies, practices, policies, right? That perhaps the institution helped to carry out. How can we reverse those, right? That's the way to acknowledge and address it. it it's not just a statement. And not just a statement. It's not just a web page that talks about it. It's, it's actual tangible movement to change and transform and reverse damage, right? And what can we do as an institution for um, to make that happen? Nice, thank you, thank you. I, I appreciate the software development angle on this. Um, I like that, thank you so much. If you don't mind, I'm gonna use it in the, in the future if I talk about that again. <laughs> um, because it's not about perfection. It's not. It's not at all about perfection. I mean, shall we root out Washington and Jefferson because they were slave owners? Root them out from what? And, and I would say yes, but we have to think about root them out how and in what ways, right? Where, are, where is their influence still um, apparent? Right? Where is their influence still apparent? I think about the nation of South Africa. At the end of apartheid, what they did as a nation was make a commitment, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and they also wrote an entire new constitution. As a country, the United States hasn't come anywhere near to having that kind of conversation. And there are elements of the legacy of enslavement that absolutely still impact the way this country operates. And we ought to do something about it. That is my opinion. We absolutely ought to be doing something about that. Yeah, thank you. How would you manage the type of change in terms of changing the, the, the issue of the college's name if it potentially alienates a segment of the community. I would say it's not if, it will alienate a segment of the community. And so you need to be prepared for the opposition that's come, that's going to come. There are some people, no matter what you do, who are gonna be adamantly opposed. You have to be prepared for opposition. You have to accept that opposition is okay and be able to ride with it. If you try to get everybody on board, you will never do anything related to actually advancing equity and justice because everybody will never get on board. And at the same time, how can you engage as an educational institution in educating people about why this change matters, right? I remember I was on, on, a, on a university committee once and one of the members of the committee said something I think was really important. Yes, you must take a stand. This is our stand. There are going to be, there are three camps of people, basically, this person articulated, and I really like it, so I use it all the time now. Um, I, I appreciate Diana. Um, it's, it's her first name for bringing this up. There are going to be people who will jump on board and say, yes, it's about time. We absolutely need to do this. Yes, let's do this. Let's go. There are gonna be people who will say, this is absolutely the wrong thing. This is the wrong decision. I'm pulling out my support. I'm gonna pull out my money. I'm never giving another cent to Henry Ford. I will not, this institution, I will not. You've lost me as a supporter. And then you've got folks in the middle, probably the largest number, the folks in the middle who say something, I mean, I, I think, I think, I understand what this is about. And I think, and I want to support the reasons behind this, but I'm just not sure. Can you help me understand more deeply what's going on? Okay. When we invest the time in educating that group of people, we may be surprised at how much more support we'll gain. OK, instead of ignoring those folks. OK, 
okay? Instead of ignoring those folks and losing them, okay? And having them become um, in opposition, part of the opposition, right? Yep, we're human, we make mistakes and we need to not just dwell in, well, I'm human and I made a mistake, right? How do I transform? How do I move toward not making that same mistake again and recognizing why it was a mistake, right? I think too many people try to take that as a cop-out. Well, I'm human, I made a mistake. Oh, well, you know, um, and don't see that as motivation for change. I think we're creeping up on um, Dr. Stewart's time at the end here, but I wanted to make sure if anyone had any final questions, and if not, if Dr. Stewart, if you had any final statements to wrap up, and then we'll turn it over to President Cavaluna to kind of wrap us up here. And thank you so much so far for everything. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you everyone for engaging, for listening. Um, there are still, there are only eight of you have had to leave <laughs> um, since we started. And I really appreciate that, um, that hanging in here uh, with me as we went on this journey uh, this afternoon. Um, I think I, I would just encourage you to not lose hope. You know, I think hope I have hope in people. I don't have hope in institutions. I have hope in people. And I believe that people can make a change. I believe in people power. I mean, from the 1970s um, and the Black Panther movement, I believe in people power. And so the, enough people um, pushing in, you know, in the opposite direction of, of the status quo can make a difference. No matter where you sit in an institution, you can make a difference. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. You're getting a lot of um, you're getting a lot of kudos through the chat, which I'm sure you're seeing. Um, we really appreciate the time that you spent with us today. I think I think it's a beginning. I think I think if we have to look at today as a beginning or if nothing else, a continuation of the work that we have to continue to do. I'm really glad that you were able to center a lot of your talk on the needs of our black students, because I do think sometimes we um, intersectionality is, is super important, but I think sometimes we don't give enough focus on our black students who do have particular issues that need to be um, acknowledged and addressed. So thank you so much for, for doing that centering, but also being um, just being as, as inclusive as you always have been with your work. Um, really, really great stuff. And I'm hopeful that we'll be able to have you come back at some point in the future after we've done some work, because we have some dredging that we need to do ourselves. Um, and then, you know, hopefully we'll be further down that line. Who knows, maybe, maybe when you come back, we'll be named something else. <laughs> That's a lot of work, but we'll see. We'll see how that works. So. Um, at this time, it's appropriate, I think, to turn it over to um, our president, President Russ Cavaluna. So um, the next voice you'll hear will be from our president. Thank you again, Dr. Stewart. Thanks, Chardon. And Dr. Stewart, I, I do have the distinct pleasure to say welcome to our college and thank you for spending time with us. I uh, very much appreciate your thoughts and your time. And of course, someday I hope that you have the opportunity to come visit us here on campus. And um, if that's ever the, can the case, I'd be honored to show you around our campus um, because I I'm gonna make a few remarks, but a, a spoiler alert, I I I'm, I'm a hopeful person like you and I'm an optimistic person, despite some, some tough things that you had us think about. I hope maybe someday that, that Twitter string you're talking about names our college and you can come and say, yeah, I found one. Um, but uh, let me start just my brief comments um, by saying thank you to uh, Chard and Claiborne. You, you have an, uh, um, a duty that I often carry and I watch how people do this and it's how to read the laundry list of thank yous, uh, Chard. And you, you started off the meeting just fine and you, you took 
uh, that obligation away from me. So I'll thank you for that. Uh, you did a great job at that. And it's not easy to do, uh, especially on Zoom. But you left one person out and that's yourself. Uh, you, you are a friend of mine, you are a professional and uh, you're a teammate at this institution. You and I have been working together on this topic uh, now for months. And I appreciate you being the spearhead to bring Dr. Stewart to us and continue to ask us the tough questions and bring other voices into this discussion. And, um, you know, it's funny, Chard and I remember, uh, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, right at the beginning of the pandemic, you and I were at a conference in Seattle and the pandemic broke out in Seattle a couple days after we left. And you and I got to know each other then and I've enjoyed our relationship since. So I want you to know that I speak for the entire college when I say thank you for um, letting this conversation take place and spearheading it to bring in a voice like Dr. Stewart's. Uh, one of the things, I wanna comment just a few things uh, that I heard from Dr. Stewart uh, and um, hopefully leave you with some thoughts, at least from my perspective. The, one of the things that Dr. Stewart said that caught my ear uh, of many was, you know, you may not be one of the persons that have institution-wide authority. And I thought, well, I can't raise my hand for that one. <laughs> uh, and um, it, it struck me because that's a legitimate point. I mean, I imagine that Dr. Stewart runs into folks that say, you know, well, what can I do? Um, and I just want you to know from one teammate in me to a teammate to you, I take that seriously because I do. I'm one of the unique employees here that do have that authority. And I take it seriously on this topic. And I want to show you with more than just words how seriously I take that. Um, you know, we have leaders that I've asked to be here who have obligated themselves to be here that show it's serious. Uh, Trustee Roxanne McDonald is here with us. Every cabinet member at the institution is here with us. And on a Friday afternoon after this event is over, the cabinet will have a special meeting where we're gonna talk about what we learned uh, and continue to think about this. So I hope um, I hope you hear my words and my actions that I, I do take this seriously and that the leaders of this institution do also, at the very least with the votes of their feet or spaces in this respect and in, in being here at this event. Uh, another comment that I thought I would, I would ask you to highlight in your, in your mind is, did you notice that Dr. Stewart asked a lot of questions? Now she, or he was very good in saying um, what we should do and giving me some ideas about where we should go forward. But he was also asking really tough questions over and over without giving us the answers. And I'm, I'm encouraging you to ask those questions of yourself and then discuss them with your colleagues. Have those discussions. And I would even encourage you that ask yourself those questions, the ones that made you uncomfortable or the ones that you may not have even liked that were asked. You should, you should really do that. And I'm encouraging you to do that. And if you want to have those discussions with me, I encourage you to do, the, do that with me also. As you all know, my email is open all day long and I respond to all of them. Another thing that Dr. Stewart mentioned was uh, a focus on equity and justice and that it is a continuum. And I completely agree with that. And I would even change the, the descriptor to a journey. I really do think we are on a journey here as an institution on these questions. And uh, I promise I wrote this down before the second part of Dr. Stewart's slide, but I wrote in our journey, we first have to ask, where are we? Where are we? And then together we have to ask, where should we go? And then we have to start checking the mile markers. Are, are we on the path? Are we getting further down the road or is that ETA that the, my kid in the back of my car seems to figure out, dad, we got 35 more minutes. Uh, is it going down or is it going up? Are we making progress? And um, some of the things Dr. Stewart mentioned, I think are really great that we somehow have stumbled, me as your leader has stumbled into some, at least somewhat of some good practices. Dr. Stewart says, well, you should think about uh, getting an idea of where you are. Well, we just finished this campus climate survey. We just finished it and I'm just getting ready to evaluate that in depth with the cabinet and then roll out the results to you all. And I promise I will be as transparent as I can. And the only limitation I can sense that we're gonna have there is we allow comments from both students and staff. And I 
I do need to protect the privacy of some of those comments if they if they if they stated names or things that were um, difficult. But other than that, you're going to get to see where we've based ourselves and where we are. And then after that, uh, I can tell you we're already planning on doing focus groups. And I know that Dr. Stewart's right. Maybe that's a little too sterile. I, I do think we we should call them community conversations, and we're going to actually get some help to do that, so that there are if there are biases, they're not native to this institution. Uh, we're gonna have help to bring in uh, people to help us foster those conversations. And if you think about it, we're already starting to do that. Even in a pandemic, we started with the town hall after George Floyd was murdered and we started talking about these things. And then all of us decided, decided this was important enough. And then I started having what, what I call First Fridays where I'm inviting you to keep coming to me the first Friday of every month and have these community conversations. Now I will acknowledge they haven't always been about this issue, but they are a culture that we're continuing to build where we have what Dr. Stewart is encouraging us to do, which is open conversations about the things that are going on in our campuses. So I take hope like Dr. Stewart does, and I hope you do too, because um, I do think if we can continue on this journey, then we can come back to Dr. Stewart and say, hey, put our name on the list. Let's see if anyone says no about us. Uh, and it's going to take some time and some work, but I'm committed to it, as are your leaders. This idea that Dr. Stewart mentioned about in, interest convergence, uh, and that in the 60s, it just happened that the politicians of this country needed some credibility on the world stage, and so they had to swallow a pill they may not otherwise swallow in some civil rights legislation. That might apply here, because folks, we've got to do better on student success. We absolutely have to do better on the students who are minoritized at this institution and their success, all the way from graduation down to the coursework. I mean, that's our motivation now. So we, we, we are well placed to have an interest convergence on these types of issues. And the last, time, the last thing I'll just talk to you about is a thing that um, also hit me right between the eyes as the, as the leader of you, your institution. And it was this idea that Dr. Stewart mentioned about these types of things can kind of get momentum and then a leader will leave or get disinterested and this, this type of stuff peters out. And I tend to agree with that. Uh, Dr. Stewart says, you know, you need this kind of leadership from the top, but also this groundswell from the ground up to, to make change work here. I agree with that also. And um, I want to tell you a story. Uh, I saw my good friend, President John McDonald of the full-time faculty collective bargaining unit here, and he and I talk a lot. And one of the things I'll just let you in on a secret that I've said to him is I don't want anything that we achieve here to be a result of my presence here and that it goes away or that we have one of the greatest deans or one of the greatest instructors in this realm or one of the greatest vice presidents. And I can say, I think we do have a lot of those things, but I've, I've, in, in difficult discussions, not because of a difficult relationship between us, but when I was talking to President McDonald about where we were headed as an institution, I said, I don't want to make changes to the way we interact with each other that are associated with and attached to me physically so that they persevere if they're the right decisions. And that's just that, that's not just a game for me. I really believe in that. And if you're interested in it, one of the great books on that topic is a book that I've handed out to some of my teammates when I've said, look, if, look, if you want to be a great leader, one of the good books to look at is Turn the Ship Around. It's by a, a guy who ran a nuclear submarine named Marquette, who got put on a, a boat that um, was his first captain assignment that was a terrible boat. They were all underperforming. And um, his mission was to get to a place where that boat performed at the highest level and did so irrespective of whether he was on board or not. And let me tell you why I believe that and show you what I mean. We have, con I have continued to beg and plead and cajole and tell you how much I believe in teamwork. And I really believe in that. I really believe that we can work as a team and accomplish anything which is why the big things that we've done at this campus over the last two and a half years, the biggest things have been products of teamwork, most of which I had nothing to do with other than to convene the team. Ask yourself about that. I mean, we did a big, difficult analysis on KP, uh, campus safety. 
we brought the college from full steam ahead on face-to-face to 90% online and then reopened the campus, then closed it and reopened it twice through a return to campus team that was a wide cross section of leaders and and uh, people with feedback and stakeholders. And I wasn't involved in any of those things. And it works because you guys were involved as a team. And so what I hope you see is, I really believe in that. And I believe in what Dr. Stewart said, which is that if you institutionalize these processes, they will survive the people that set them up. And I hope that we can do that with this question of equity and justice, which is why we're taking such a methodical and thoughtful process to look at it. And which is why I've been resistant to just do window dressing, which is also why I'm sitting here listening and being educated myself so that we can set up the processes to actually move us down the road in this journey. And that it won't have anything to do with me personally. I hope that that gives you some view of what I thought of the presentation today. Uh, I always like to take questions also, Dr. Stewart, so uh, I'm happy to take those now, but it is Friday. You guys are still battling through a pandemic, and I I could just give you the gift of 10 minutes more on your day if if you didn't have any questions. But Mr. Claiborne, I think the work you've put in gives you the right to close this meeting, and if there are no questions, I'll let you do that. I'm looking. There's been a lot of activity in the chat, but I don't see any any questions. So um, again, I just want to thank everyone who who came. Again, this wasn't a mandatory session. Um, And I'll share, I really, really wanted it to be a mandatory session. And I did have some support on on that, but it just wasn't able to happen. But the reality is, is that the work gets done by those who do the work. And if you're here today, you're part of trying to be, you know, um, solutions. To, to what we need to do. So I'm really proud of, of the people who are here today. I'm, I'm really happy for the interaction that I saw in the chat. Um, I'm really thankful um, to be at Henry Ford and anything that, I, anything that I found myself to be a part of, I've always tried to, to do my part to make it, to make, us, make it as good as it can be. And, and I'm committed to continuing that effort um, for as long as I'm here and as long as Henry Ford will have me. Um, and I have 10 years, so I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but <laughs> all jokes aside, you know, we have a little bit of time. So maybe, maybe what's appropriate now is, um, you know, if there are no questions, we can just kind of reflect away from this, think about the things kind of sit with us. And then we need to continue the momentum I'm really, really glad to hear some of the things that President Cavaluna mentioned today, but there are also pockets that are doing work and maybe we need to find ways to to make those pockets intersect better so that we're all having these communications and and just doing um, a better job of of working in tandem with each other for the good of, of the whole. So... Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. Thank you. to. I'm sure I missed some people on thanks, so I'm, I apologize for that. But thank you to everyone who's been a part of this, because this was not a was not a chart and play board production. This was a, a pick committee production. Um, and I hope that you all have a great weekend. I look forward to one day seeing you in person again and um, take care. Thank you.